have two babies, and uh, I think you stopped me once and told me that my, my baby is out in the garage. And uh, yeah. Anyway, we, uh, I had it growing up um, for a bit with my husband and me and one of our neighbors, and um, he was asking uh, what I was uh, doing, and I told him I was just about to open the space called the library. It's even worse when you get sold too. I don't know if you have that problem, but I was like, 
feel this sort of connection with salespeople and I want to help them out and all of that. But the thing is, I just don't enjoy the whole activity of hard selling. I, I, I don't know, it's just, it just doesn't go with my personality. And I don't know, if, do, do many of you feel the same way? Is it something that you find like it's like that hill that you have to climb up? Yeah, I have to call this person again. I have to, should I now just cross that line of act, actually asking for the money and stuff like that? I have trouble with that. And so I really need a system because I'm terrible when it comes to asking for the business. I'm way too good. I want to be abundant and generous and all this and that. But I needed this sort of system that would make sure that I would ask for the business when I needed it. So um, there's something amazing. We're not alone. There's so many people who feel like that because the, have you ever, I did some research on this and there's, you know why 10% of salespeople get 80% of the business? I, I, I did some research on this. I went online and I looked up some numbers and it may be 15%, it may be 7%. No, I may be wrong, maybe 20%. But honestly, just very few people are getting the biggest part of the pie. And, you know, and that is kind of like, I'm wondering, like, how is that possible? This is, you know, how is, how is, how is such a reality uh, it's almost, when you in front of the data, it's almost unimaginable. So I, I went up to some more research. And I found out that only 2% of deals are done at the first meeting. Uh, but that's not exactly right, because when somebody effectively comes in and buys your product or hires your service, it means that they've sort of been doing their own research, they've been doing some work, or they've essentially gotten so much confidence from a third party and stepped in, uh, and stepped in basically to purchase. And I'm not speaking about retail. This is really focused on service providers and people who have long cycle businesses. So it's really the exception. And more research showed me that, look, the accuracy of these numbers, give or take 10%, okay? But 48%, uh, almost half of salespeople just never follow up. I have that. When I call somebody for a service, most of the time they never call me back to see if I'm still interested. Happens. Happens to me, happens to everybody. I think. Uh, my, my percentage used to be 70%. I wouldn't even follow up. You know, I'll tell you about that later. Only 25% make a second contact. Uh, and even worse, 12% make more than three contacts. Now, I, I don't want to do this whole statistical presentation, but it turns out that 80% of the deals, 80 something percent of the deals, uh, are done after more than eight interactions. So, 98% of the business never happens because less than 12% people follow up. It's an enormous opportunity for those who do, but you have to feel right about that follow up. The thing is, what do buyers think about this? That's the other side of the thing. Think about yourself now for a second. When you're trying to contract a service or you're trying to get uh, somebody to provide you with, uh, with information about something, often we're also the victims. I mean, I feel like that most of the time. And buyers are statistically also very frustrated because a lot of salespeople are lazy. And it's gonna make more sense to you why buyers get frustrated about that. I'm gonna give you a hint, because guess what? Salespeople are also problem solvers in many industries. And I, get, I got some more fun. 70%, and this is from Velocify.com, they do this all day long, it's what they do for a living. They, uh, they look at uh, purchasing decisions. They take statistics of it. 70% of buyers, we're, to uh, we're totally ignored when, when they even pop up, whether it be online or in a B2B scenario. 60, so all these numbers are very similar. It's like three quarters, generally, or either, you know, so they just basically stop the purchasing decision because when you get the service, but even more like three quarters said that the people who actually bought it to follow up had a massive advantage in getting the business. Right? That's a big hint here. And, you know, the good news is that like, this is, again is an opportunity because the 25% who make more than one contact actually have, the, have a major advantage in winning 72% of the business. So what this means is that all you need is a system that is going to help you follow up flawlessly. It's as simple as that. You just have to do it. And then if, if somebody once told me there's two ways to look at a phone. You can see it like um, a Las Vegas fruit machine or you can see it as a weight. Some of us have to look at it as a fruit machine. So, but the thing is, what I've been developing, because I have this problem, again, I'm, I'm, I'm a lazy salesperson, I guess I fall in that category, and I don't feel good selling, I wanted to develop a system. So, well, 
often to FFU. And guess what? That's what this system does. It's a system to help you follow up consistently. Um, and why don't we follow up more? Um, if you don't agree with anything I say, please tell me. But uh, so I'm, this is when I'm sort of speaking from, from my chart, right? This is how I feel. You, you tell yourself you're too busy. And that's kind of ridiculous, right? You, you wind up convincing yourself, I'm speaking for myself, I don't know if you feel the same way, that you can be too busy to follow up. You're too busy doing what? The question is, you're too busy doing what? You're too busy creating work? Or in the end, who pays the bills? How can you be too busy to follow up? I, again, I fall on that excuse, I'm guilty of anybody else. And there's a fear of failure. That's a big one. Uh, that is, uh, you know that, that you feel knocked down all the time. How many times can you keep standing up? There's uh, the stigma, like selling is, can you see the screen? Am I standing in the way? I'm looking. Okay. Um, the stigma is like, oh, it's like a, it's like a, selling is, selling has a bad reputation because some people just don't do it right. Selling is this sort of perverse thing, right? And I, and I, and I dealt with that as well. Like when I said, what are people thinking of me when I'm going to that salesperson mode? I, I, I fear to be seen as that guy who wants to sell the whole effing universe. Uh, and then there's this thing about status. And maybe that's a European thing. Uh, I'm from Europe myself. I, I don't always sound European, but I'm from Europe, totally European. Uh, you know, there's a status thing of selling. Uh, but the thing is, by not selling, what we sometimes forget is that we come across as being sort of arrogant. We don't even care to sort of lower ourselves to the level of a salesperson, even though, even though we can be a business owner. Um, but you're also conveying that you don't care much about your business. But you're, you're, conveying, uh, you're conveying to the customer that you don't care about it. So that's, again, remember the buyer's perspective, that's what they see. And you're sort of already giving a hint that your service level is probably not going to be all that good. Right? And the sales process is a journey. But more than just, it's not our journey, it's the prospect's journey. And, and this is really when we're getting into the what FFU or, or Flawless follows is trying to model here. The prospect goes through a journey which starts with a challenge. Uh, generally, they're confronted, and this is specifically in B2B scenarios. They're, they're confronted with a, uh, a problem that needs solving. And then you go into a discovery mode where they sort of start changing their mind about old rooted beliefs because they have to solve the problem. And, and they're starting to commit to change. And this is when your prospect is opening uh, his or her mind to new possibilities. And the consideration is where they go and they explore possible solutions. It's when they go into research, they're trying to gather knowledge. And then there's a decision, a justification, and a selection. We're going to go into much more depth about these different phases and what they mean for this method that I put together. And this method is not rocket science. It's modeled on something that we all intuitively know. It's modeled on something that we all know that we should be paying attention to. The sales process, therefore, uh, while it still seems like a treacherous place to go, it can actually become very dark. And then this is, I don't know, this is my reality. Um, you know, get them on the phone. I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm very good on the phone. I don't like to speak on the phone. Those meetings, I feel like I'm wasting my time most of the time with these meetings. Sometimes the personal chemistry is not right, whatever. But I have other things on my mind and I feel like I'm too busy to have meetings with my clients. I don't know if you have that feeling, I have that feeling. Uh, these RFPs, I don't know if you have to fill out RFPs, those are killers, I hate those. And what about those, this is, this is the thing that, that, excuse my language, pisses me off the most, the no-shows. My, my, my biggest no-show that I'm still, I'm really mad at these people still, is I remember that, this is in 2006, I flew all the way out to Dubai. So, and they convinced me to come over because I can't redo this two weeks later because I had, I had a lot of traveling during those two weeks. I flew all the way out to Dubai, convinced by the guy who I had been talking to for a few weeks, correspondence by email, says, you have to come and present it to the decision maker. The decision maker forgot about it. And I went to Dubai on an overnight flight. I got there, and the guy just totally forgot about it. He was doing something entirely different. And I had my ticket booked back, and I flew back without that. Worst of all, I had to convince my boss, because at the time when I worked in the bank, that I had to go to Dubai. And he said, like, so how was that Dubai adventure? And I said, well, he didn't even show up. So, you know, these kind of things 
that to me sort of did something to me. I said, like, I gotta change this. I, got, I gotta find a different approach to this. But I don't know if this, this resonates with you, but you know, sales is a lot of work and you know, you get paid to do it, I guess. But I remember the follow up thing. Well, the next thing is so, okay, so you're dedicated, you have, you have a system. So I'm gonna follow the system, I'm gonna implement it. And then the next question arises how many people can you actually follow up on if you fully follow your full routine? I mean, it's not like you have this whole sales force that you can deploy and then look at these KPIs and, and hire and fire salespeople because we're talking between small businesses, right? It's clearly a small business. So um, the other part is like, okay, so to follow up, either you build this disciplinary routine, but then again, like, you think like, okay, so how many people can I actively like stay on top of, be disciplined? Because if I have to stay on top seven, eight, nine, ten times, how am I going to organize myself? Some people are good at that. Some people are. I definitely am not. Um, but then there's technology. And the technology, uh, that's the kind of thing that I thought, like, you know, technology is actually, you can, it can get you a pretty unfair advantage because you can do amazing things with technology. And so I started creating a systems that were sort of, um, I wanted the follow-up process um, not only to be more scalable and efficient, but I also want it to be more measurable. Because the, here's another thing. If you do something in an analog fashion, following up, how do you know you're dealing with the right person? I mean, you sometimes find that out after like sixth or seventh iteration when they finally don't do the business with you. So I wanted to build a, this is, I had a desire to use, now I was playing around with um, email systems and websites and website analytics. And I was totally diving into that world, and I thought, I can do something with this. And so I just want to make sure my laptop doesn't fall down. And I started thinking about, what if we use all this technology, this connectivity? We, have, we all have email addresses, and you know, I'm taping this now on video, by the way, so I can give it to you later. And you have this recording of this and content with slides in the background of the whole thing. We have this amazing technology to create content. Now what if we start thinking about creating the kind of content that does much of the prospecting for us? So if you couldn't make it tonight, you can get a video of this presentation, or I can, I can really record my best presentation on video and send it to my prospect. That way I wouldn't have to do it myself, or I could avoid having a bad day, and if I do it a little bit more professionally, it can look great, sound great, and all those kind of things. What if I can make a singing and dancing video about my product? Technology is limitless. and so. Start tinkering with the idea of what if I create kind of content with technology that does the selling for me instead of me having to go and do it. That's where this whole thing sort of started with me. And so um, I, I found it quite compelling. I, and, and today I, I get people calling me say, uh, somebody forwarded me your video. I, I think that's really interesting. Can we talk? Or I do a webinar with a client instead of, instead of doing a personal meeting. I insist on meeting online now. Why? Because I tell them I'm going to hit the record button. Oh, really? So yeah, I'm going to tell you why I'm going to do that. I'm going to say, so you don't have to take notes. You have a note of this in an audiovisual format. But more importantly, if you like what we're doing here, you can send it to your boss, or you can send it to your client, or you can show it to your colleague. And guess what? We don't have to do those five meetings anymore because you have it on file. This is what we said. The added bonus is that people are also on really good behavior when they're being recorded, and they focus more on using your timer. So there's a lot of advantage to it. Creating content that people can share with others is extremely powerful. There's, and that gives you the opportunity for scale. The opportunity for scale is tremendous. It's, it's limitless. Uh, you can, there's, there's three billion people on the planet who are connected to the internet. There's going to be five billion in four and a half years. And you can still keep your focus. So you, you create the content, you scale up your coverage, but you keep focus. Guess what? Because I'm going to tell you about that in a little moment. You can measure what's being done with your content because you're digital. And everything that's digital can be measured, which is the, let me say that slowly, I'm talking too fast, but <laughs> anything that can be, anything digital can be measured, right? And there's a way to do this. There's a way to deliver this to people. <coughs> and you, where do you go to people? It's the place where they spend most of their time. And where is that? On their, in their inbox. People spend most of their productive day in their emails. They get interrupted in their work because the emails come in. People use emails on their phones. People are always doing emails. So what you gotta get obsessed about is how can you earn a space in that inbox, a respected space, 
That's the thing that you have to try to keep. And I'm going to give you some simple math. And I'm really bad at math, so I hope I, I, don't, I don't triple over this one. But I'm going to compare the traditional in-person sales approach, and I'm then later on I'm going to compare it to the more tech-driven approach, right? So we asked that question before. How many people can you follow up with? And then let's say it's 50 prospects. That's decent, right? That's sort of like genuinely... Uh, a regular rhythm of following up and say you have a 10% conversion rate. That to me seems like the right number. I don't know about you. I think it's I, actually in my industry it's lower, but it seemed like a fair conversion rate for this presentation or for, so it's like the average it said. That means that 50 prospects at all time at your funnel or your pipeline, whatever people want to call it. I hate calling them by the way. It's for oil and water and liquid, not for sales. But five would come out of your pipeline at all times. So at all times you'd be working at a conversion ratio for five. And assuming that it takes at least five <laughs> contacts, it means that you're going to have 250 interactions, right? And that's all done by personal efforts, which means time. And the problem is, how do you know? And that's, some people say like, this is a, an art, is it experience? I don't know, I just, how do you know that you're spending time with the right people? Because often what people forget is that it's not only them who make the decisions. These people rely on other people to approve, or they have clients on their own, they have to convince in turn. So there's a lot of loose ends there. Then again, take it from me, I'm sort of like a tech geek, so I'm always gonna like lean towards the technology solution, right? The automated, that's the key word here, it's automated. You're gonna build a robot that you, uh, that's gonna do a lot of the work for you, the boring work, the fun work you keep for yourself, but the boring work is for the robot. Is a technology-driven follow-up sequence Remember the word sequence, we're going to go into sequence more. Assuming that the conversion rate is lower. So for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to penalize the conversion rate from 5 to 2.5%. Okay? Because there's no people involved. Uh, I'm just doing this to prove my point. Uh, actually, I think the conversion rate is higher with technology, but I'm going to prove the point with it. It would take only 200 contacts, automated contacts, to get five clients, right? And the thing with these sequences driven on email is that they're tremendously scalable. So even if you would interact with a thousand prospects, it means that you could still get 25 clients without an increase in effort from the analog approach. That's kind of interesting, right? No increase in effort. It's automated because you've created the content. And some of you here on my mailing list, right? Mm -hmm. I come into your inbox every now and then, right? And I'm, I'm sort of like trying to gain your trust by doing that. But eventually I, I may make a sale with you. But I don't have to do anything. It comes into your inbox. So uh, 25 clients for the same effort. You can, what if you can find a way to cover 10,000? Do the math yourself. But the advantage is because it's digital, you can measure it. And you can see who's paying attention. How does that work? It's very simple. Did, did you guys use an email client like MailChimp or Aweber? Right. You know you can see who's watching your stuff, right? Um, uh, if you do this on mass, you can actually figure out who who is paying attention to what you're doing. So, Colbert, yes. So, if you so what you're saying is, you get your your mailing list in order, and then instead of sitting there scrolling in front of the phone, you send out the emails. Yeah, I'm going to show you what the sequence how that works. Okay. That's your robot. That's the robot that's going to do the work for you. And another way, even more simple math is. What if you combine technology and your human analog approach? Then it becomes really powerful. You've got to see this as a funnel, right? Your new prospects, so it sort of like goes, the automated email sequence, this could be those thousand people. And then they become intermediate as they survive your communication uh, sequence. And then by the time you have more information, you become the, what I call the self-selected prospect. Because, you know, they've been paying attention to your content. You can see, oh, these guys have opened 40% of the emails I've sent to them. Hmm, there must be something there. And that's when you can start focusing on the real prospects who've proven that they are interested. And I, I completely changed my thinking on this. A decade ago, less even, maybe six or seven years ago, I still believed that you needed to have a personal encounter in order to guarantee the possibility of business. And I completely went 180 degrees on this one because, in fact, 
because it's just not feasible. It's not economical. You waste a lot of time. But I also say like sometimes at first you need to like mm. I wasn't feeling good that day. I should have canceled and did another day. You know, I, I was angry at something, or I was just tired, or I was sick, and and, and I dropped the wrong people, or I didn't connect with the person. The chemistry was wrong. All those kind of things. Just there's a big risk factor. It's kind of messy to meet in person for the first time. It can go all ways, right? But what I felt is that if I would start making sense to people in a digital way, I use a lot of videos, I use a lot of audio, I, I try to present things nicely. And people start consuming my content. Please, I don't want to sound arrogant with this, I really don't. But it's the only way I can explain it. It's almost like when somebody then meets you, it, they almost meet you like from the standpoint of a sort of a fan, because you, they've been spending time on you, you've given them value, they have absorbed what you have to say, and then they finally get to meet you, and everything is in your advantage all of a sudden. They're going to forgive things from you. They're going to they're gonna like you more, because they had an anticipation, and they were looking forward to meeting you. And, and this is extremely powerful. So I turn this one around. I mean, first, I, I just really want to start engaging with people who have actually been able to prove to me that they're interested by consuming my content. And some of them are yeah, flame back at me, and that's I love it when people complain about the content because I learn from it and I make it better. But yeah, I'm just, you know, I, it, I, I don't need to get your approach. <laughs> okay. Because when you can, you pre filtering the people, I mean, what you do, you select the people, I mean, you let them select you, and then you meet them in person. That would be ideal, yeah. yeah so well to I do I that 100% would be amazing. I, I completely approach <laughs> the other way around. <laughs> I mean, I meet them in person, and then I let them select, because then, you know, I think that you're missing out on many opportunities. Because what if online you said, okay, it wasn't why it was that day. Therefore, they don't like you, they're not going to be going on business with you. Mm -hmm. But what if they don't like the place online? What if they are this old fashioned guy, which there are plenty of them, but they just don't use online techniques? Yeah, yeah I, I get you. I mean, it's, uh, I'm not saying that this is the only way, right? I'm, I'm saying that. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. even, and I, I consider myself to be still in the young generation. Mm -hmm. I am still not that much, I, I, I don't really put a lot of trust into mm -hmm. online. Uh, Do you know on average 
How long does a person watch a YouTube video? For how many minutes? It depends on what kind of content they're looking for, but you can segment it in whether it's really looking for information which is concrete or whether it's just entertainment. But on average, it's 25 seconds. Yeah, yeah, I know, but it's cute because one of the, I actually look at that stuff a lot. Yeah. Um, the, the way that you have one of the problems with statistics is that if if you um, if you generalize it, you know, I live and dive into con I live in the content world. There's different types of needs for content, and you have to see, try to segment them. I mean, if somebody's really looking for a solution, you're going to spend more time on content. And that's what I'm talking about here. Yeah. I'm talking about you have a solution for people who have a problem. Mm -hmm. People who have a problem can find you because you can, ex you can, not only can you acknowledge their problem, but you can also help them. We're going to get into that. That's in the next sort of, the 70 slides, it goes fast, but there's, there's, a, there's a point where I go like, where you actually go, and make that special connection. You know what? Because usually, at least what I believe, people connect when they're in trouble and they need a solution. And what I do is kind of weird, I know. And for people to come and cross my line, they gotta be sort of desperate or really in trouble. They need to grow their business. They need to figure out a way. They realize that they're not good at selling. They realize that they need to get results. So it's very difficult to generalize. And, and I, I, get, I hear you, I get you totally. Uh, there is an advantage to the people, the personal interaction, if that's what you're enabling them, that's great. All right, hold on. We have you yeah, and you. But I just wanted to uh, hold the, the idea that this will be too much already because, well, I myself am a visual professional who works with yeah. visual stuff. Yeah, but the branding. <laughs> But I think one of the mistakes you're all making is that you're thinking like, you know, you're just going to be sitting in your office and this robot is going to go beep, 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 look for clients. No, no. What, I, what, I'm, what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to tell you here is the following. It, it, the, a part of your, you're going to be, if you do this right, you're going to be surprised that a part of your, uh, you know, you pull out your fishing net out of the water, you're going to, actually something is in there. But most of the time it's when you meet somebody at a conference or doing a dinner party and they give you their card, when you stick it into your system. Okay, okay. So, so don't confuse that. I'm, this is gonna become clear in the next 10 slides or so. Okay, so what I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to do right now is, I'm trying to get you to consider, and I'm not trying to convince you. I'm, 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 I'm doing this for free. I'm, 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 I'm wanting, I, I want you to consider, <laughs> I want you to consider the possibility of, of applying technology to your process. So I want you to consider Getting there by that to get there, okay? Just quickly. Yeah, I, no, it, it's, and, and I apologize, I'm not at all a tech geek, but I just. God bless you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know if it, it's a nice method you describe, but as far as I know, there are several computer systems that make sure that you don't see if your name is going to be read or not. Yeah, true. So, so but it's about the spam thing. Are you a spammer? I mean, that's the thing. I mean, even, even the people that you, you, you pay a fee to MailChimp, and if you misbehave, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna tell whoever needs to know that these guys are spamming. They have to. Or they but if, well, let's say I have a lot of prospective clients. I want to meet, and I know they have a system that makes it hard to yeah. see if they read my emails. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, but that's a, that's another that's an interesting one you put up. A very se very quick segue. I used to have these ongoing discussions with my colleagues when I was in, in, in the financial world. Like the more formal financial world about ah, these guys, they, they, they're on a million list, they're hot now. I said, that's awesome because it's a personal email, they care. Mm -hmm. It's worth more than a professional email because that's probably the email where they correspond with their brother, their sister, their parents, their wife, their friend. You're on there. That's, an, that's a privilege because people want the corporate mail to be spammed. They don't care if it's some guy in IT they're going to take care of it, right? But being on someone's personal email is like, congratulate yourself. Move on. So, you guys all cut me off before that one. <laughs> is meeting in person always the better option? You know, I don't know. It depends on the personality of people. Like, I like people, I really do. I, but honestly, there's so much that can go wrong that terrifies me. I spent way too much money uh, with those kind of scouts. 
And I'm not always on my best behavior. Um, but so that, and this is where we come. What kind of emails do you always open? Uh, apart from those from the boss, the clients, you know, uh, brother, family, all those kind of things. It's the ones that help you become better at what you do. Those are the emails that are not spam. Those are the ones that like, it's my dose of insight. It's my, it's my, my little dosage of solutions. It's, it's what makes me a better pro. Whether it could be uh, having something to talk about over the next business lunch or whether it can be actually something that helps you solve a problem. And we're moving to closer towards that um, positioning. And we're, we're going to speak a lot about understanding who you're doing business with and understanding what the problems are so you can resonate with them, right? How am I doing on time? Am I, am I running along? No, no. no okay. So, how do you get the uh, how do you get the attention span the, the the spam thing and the attention span? How do you get over that? That's a big problem. We spoke about this before. Right? How do you get around that? But you know the thing about I think email people say email does not work, and this is typical. I've been through this all the time. See this one, so I want to check in about. I'm busy. I'm sorry. Can we talk tomorrow? And then two weeks later, it's like, hey, I thought I'd call about. Sorry, I'm traveling. Uh, can we do this next week? And then months or weeks later, they're like, we haven't spoken in months, and then there's nothing. This is what people think of email. This is, for most people, the reality of email is that. It's true, it is like that for most people. Because you're not sending the right emails. You're not doing it right. There's a different way to send emails. What makes an effective email? What, there's actually a recipe for this. There's recipes for baking great cookies, and there's recipes for but you cook it tastes like shit. And most people don't know how to bake cookies. You go one topic at a time. You make it very intentional. The, the worst thing you can do is like, hey, let's catch up. When you have a mic. That's like, sorry, my inbox is full. Why are you doing this to me? Make it consumable. Make it, um, you know, well, for example, most of the time I don't even go like, hello, and I, was like, I don't even say best regard. I just say, boom, this is what you need to know. That's when I'm in a, in a, in a, in a, in a line of correspondence. People say, you're rude on email, man. I said, well, I, I think I'm getting through because I'm actually saving you time. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is you have to make it consumable. Keep it one topic at a time, intentional consumable. Useful resonance. Is, uh, is it an email from a person or is it an email from a company? There's a big difference there. Right? Um, the frequency is important. Uh, sending like, oh, i got to send this guy a batch of stuff. Sending in five or six emails is really not a good idea, really. The extra you have time to resonate. Call to action. People need to be told what to do. It's funny, but when you're in the inbox mode, I don't know about you, I actually use my email at three point, I, I, I don't open my email when I wake up. I only open my email at 10 a.m. Because I need to get some stuff done. In my mind, in my work, and work that matters. I want to do that first. But, uh, I live around here, I like to walk in the park when I go to work. Take a longer walk than I should because I want to sort of like think about my day. That's just my routine. I open my inbox at 10. And I go through my inbox and do the four Ds, you know, the delete, delegate, do, or defer. I do that. I just get, get it cleaned up. Shut down my inbox. Off I go again. Pierre knows this. Pierre knows that I hardly uh, I have these like moments that I respond to all the text messages and emails at once, right? Because I do this in a systematic way. I do it in the evening. Uh, that's when I'm sort of like closing down my office. And I don't do email apart from that. I, 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 I send my emails to this other thing called Evernote so I can read it in, ba in, in, in batch. You know, like, and it, the thing is, Jesus, I went off track there, sorry. <laughs> right, you gotta tell people what to do on email, it's very important. And then a demonstration of service. Your email is your ambassador. If you can give service on an ongoing basis, people are gonna understand that these people have a service level. And then the less is more rule, as in everything in design and life and everything, is that uh, less content per email means more interactions, means more relationship if you're doing it right. Jesus, a good question. Good yeah? I, I would like to just say one I'd love some more ones. Do you have some more? Oh, yeah. 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 So basically, if I have two important topics I want to be covered, should I send two emails or like, um, you know? Or like yeah, it's actually a better idea. Yeah? Not on the same day, actually. Yeah? No? I believe in that. But I think it, it, it makes sense because sometimes you, you know the second point might get you know missed in the yeah. in the body of the first email. Yeah. 
Yeah, the worst nightmare is when someone says you the email with five attachments and then and I'm gonna send you something on the shepherd cover and there's another three attachments there. Yeah. It's like D D. Right? Yeah. It's like sorry. I don't know about you, but this is again I speak from my personal experience, but no, but when I used to do that, I didn't get much of a response either. I had to chase people out. Did you read the email? Did you yeah. look at the attachment? <laughs> yeah. When you have to convey it. So you actually, the, uh, the fact that you make your emails a little bit more consumable focused and, and on topic, actually, there's a thing about the humans when we start corresponding, we feel like we have a relationship. Mm-hmm. That's only good for you. Yeah. I have the impression that it's more uh, marketing than sales. It's marketing or sales. So in a, it's just another perspective, another way of selling. It's, it's about. Yeah, I mean, selling and marketing uh, are very similar things, but they're actually going to they're going to merge in the next uh, months, years. I, on the corporate level, that's already happening. So, in the corporate level, what you see is a marketing department. There's always. Have you worked in large companies where like they're the marketing guys and it's almost like rivals on the same side of a war? It gets ridiculous sometimes, but uh, you know, like marketing is in, is in control here. Uh, but there's, you know, there's this online dimension that a lot of salespeople don't get, and so they're always a few steps ahead of them. But they're good. Marketing and sales is a, is a profession that is merging increasingly as we see it. And if, if you have a small business, that thing is the same thing anyway. There's no way around it because operations also. <laughs> <laughs> you actually become your own accountant most of the time. But uh, human resources, motivator, and copy maker. How does this thing work then? Let's, let's, let's talk a little bit more practical. So how this works, is this is essentially an iteration. So it's a system to earn relationships of trust by supplying knowledge, okay? And, and so it's like the prospect zone and the client zone. What you do is, it starts with a relationship and some knowledge. The relationship is still very small. Maybe you met in person. Most of the time, that's how it happens. Or somebody says, like, I want to engage with these people who are interested. But it also, there's also a bit of knowledge that people decide that I want to continue to speak to that person because there may be an element of knowledge. And then as you start sharing knowledge, trust builds on that. And all those three components get better bigger and over time that's why you need time in any long sales cycle these things build over time you know this i'm not telling you anything new right technically how this works is um and that's what i call the magic of email dripping you, you use an autoresponder maybe when you go on a holiday your program when somebody sends you an email they get an automatic response have you ever thought about the fact that you can actually map the sequence of the journey of your client as an email responder. Like where you, you fig I'm gonna talk about this in detail, but where every X amount of days you can you can get my new company that, that, that we're setting up, we're getting really sophisticated about it because it depends on actions of each prospect where there's a different sequence that starts. It's it's deep I don't believe it's amazing. But what you can do is you can essentially program an email sequence that comes into people's world as long as it's not like it's not like you're gonna send an email every five days and say, hey, you want to catch up? No. It's an email which actually builds on the sales process. It's look look at that. So you have this big communication device and all these big tools. <coughs> and the, the thing you always have to remember it's not about our agenda. We make that mistake, you know. Uh, you, you try to so like you, you think in terms of your agenda, but you should be thinking about the prospect's challenge, okay? That's how you win business. You they have a problem, you have a solution. It's, it's about their problem. I mean, they pay the bills, right? We often ignore them. So the thing is, the amazing, this is real, this is a screenshot. This is, this is from two of my lists that I run. 46%, 45%, 49%. This one didn't do very well. 43%. I don't remember what the title was on that one, but maybe it was a totally wrong title, but 49%, 45%. I get these open rates. Why? Because when I send stuff, I really work hard to make sure that this is on sequence, on track with the needs of my prospects. I make sure that what I transmit to them is valuable, is insightful, something that they can do something with, or at least maybe learn something. So most of the time, those who get my emails, I'm not selling anything to you, right? I'm just giving you things to think about. I'm helping you forward. I'm helping you take new perspectives on things sometimes. I'm actually 
giving you some tricks and, and tips for every now and then. But if you do this, if you respect the rule of good content, you can get those kind of open rates. So go back to that 10,000. 10,000 now becomes 4,500 people looking at your stuff. It's interesting. Isn't it? So I was like, you have to fact your client. And what I mean is like, FAQ your client. I mean, you know, you know the frequent asked questions your client have. You know why? Because you have a pitch book. See, I think that's the next slide. You have a pitch book. You have a pitch book. You know what clients, you, you've, you've presented it so many times that you already know, almost know what they're going to ask next. You know this intuitively if you've been in business long enough. You know what they get stuck. You know what they get That's a presentation deck. Uh, so you, you build that, you modify it, you go to a bad meeting and change it. You get two good meetings and make it even better. Things like that. But, you know, the thing is that uh, you have to sort of find out what their, because since you're in the business of helping them, you naturally have a way of figuring out what their pain points are. The thing what I'm going to do with this method is we just map that out. The attitude from, remember that film, I love this scene from, the help me help you, that's the attitude from where you create all your content. You know, you essentially help your client uh, win. The perspective you need to do is that you're at service of your client. We all know this, and this is like, everybody knows. But the thing that you, it's not about your product, really, and especially if you're a small company, it's about the risks. What are, what are the dimensions of risk? Because most of the time, you may be dealing with someone who belongs to a company, a corporate. And there's monetary risk, which is obviously, they have a budget and they don't want to be called in for misspending their budget, although a lot of companies do. But more importantly, reputation, career risk, regulatory risk, social, and operational. So the only thing you need to achieve is that. You want to go into the jungle with a guy who knows what he's doing. You know, you, you want to be the guy on a journey. And you want to be the kind of guy that looks like this. This is the guy that you want to become. You need to be that person that people can trust to take you into a new territory. Because when a client, most of the time they're doing something new, they're solving a problem, it's that's, that's sort of giving them enough pain for them to come to you and ask you to solve it to them. They need to see that kind of person to help them through. They have to trust you. It's like, this guy can take you through the jungle. That's who you have to become for them. And so remember that prospect's journey. Well, this is what that really looks like. We're almost finished there. Okay? And so it starts with that problem he's solving. The, the prospect seeks guidance on what to do about a problem. And we are there to acknowledge that problem. Because you know, you know what happens when somebody's, somebody uh, starts realizing I have, to, I have this problem. And all of a sudden there's this other company person or whatever who's starting to acknowledge that that problem exists. Hey, we can talk to each other for hours, right? We have this, we're on the same page. So whether you do this online or you do this in person, um, you have to have clarity about what problem you're solving and, and be always ready to articulate that very clearly. Because then the, the prospect understands in the discovery phase that there's a need for a change. And that's when, the, and that's when um, we help the prospect understand what the alternatives are. They know they need to change something, but they don't always know how to go with it. They don't you know whether they should, uh, they should follow Feng Sui or take a design course, or they should, you know, go for a lawsuit or settle. They just don't know what the options are, you know? Or they should um, stay in their town or relocate, right? They just don't know. You have to open their mind to what is possible, your possibilities. That's what your content should look like. Those are those emails that they start getting about, oh, so if I move to Brussels, it's kind of interesting because, why is that interesting? And also in Brussels, it's close to Paris. Oh, and there's, you see, there's all these little things that can help them make that decision, right? And then the prospect is now in full research mode. Now he's really getting, he says, okay, I gotta make this work, I gotta make this change. They're researching. And this is where we start understanding their FAQs. This is where our sequence drips in where we start answering the frequent asked questions almost before they ask them. We more or less know the sequence of those. And we pop up in their inbox with the answers to the questions that they're about to ask or are asking at that moment. And there's no magic, it's not about reading people's minds, it's about knowing your industry and your business very well, but most importantly, knowing your prospects and your clients, what their problems are. And then justification and selection. And so this is where the, the prospect is preparing the case. Uh, we, but the, the thing is, 
most of the time, the person you're dealing with is not the final decision maker. And this is where we have to help them make that decision internally. We, there comes a moment in the, in the, in the pyramid, the very pyramid, where we get on the same team as a prospect to convince his boss. Right? That just happens. This is the reality. So this is where we provide things like, you know, videos that explain things very clearly so I can share with our colleagues. This is where we make checklists or the thing that I love is companies that do convince your boss material, you know? Like basically give an executive brief you can give your boss so you can make a decision. Can you see this? This is, this is a busy slide. It's probably the most important one of all. It starts here. You get the permission to communicate. The permission to, so, by the way, don't get a list of emails and start doing this with a list of emails without permission. That's called spam. You need to get permission. How do you get permission? It's two channels. You meet somebody, or they find you online. How many of you have an email sign-up page on the front page of your website? Okay, it's very important. Because your website is an email collection machine. That's the only thing it's there for. That's because, that is if you believe in this, right? That's where you're, it's almost like, when I see an email without a sign-up page, I go like, you stand in front of the shop, the shop window without a door. It's frustrating. You guys have a phone number, you probably just send in e info at, no. The challenge starts. Why we are in business to solve the problem. This is what we start, that's the first kind of message we tell people. Why do we do this? Uh, what do we stand for? I mean, who are we, really? And then we talk about that problem in discovery mode. People are discovering the fact they have a problem. Um, who we are, why the problem is important to us. Do we care about this problem? Uh, are we there to solve that problem with everything that we've got? Is this why we built our business to solve that problem? It's very important. The mistakes and the successes we have. The mistakes thing is the thing that creeps people out entirely. If you can talk about your mistakes and tell people what you learned about them openly, people will trust you a lot more, believe me, they will. Because they probably have seen people make those mistakes and they respect you for telling them about it. The goal is you resonate with the prospect. Now you have a relationship that's warm. The discovery phase, we describe the possibilities. Those are, by the way, those are all emails, okay? Those are like the different, this could be your autoresponder. That's what mine looks like in, 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 in my other business. We describe the possibilities, and then we help the prospect ask the right questions. Some, sometimes here they don't know what questions to ask, really. Uh, you know, maybe it's their boss who's like bothering them with a the problem, and they don't know how to answer the questions of the boss. We know what kind of questions they get asked. Maybe we do. You know, case studies. We show them what, what's been going on in the past they, so they can learn mistakes that were made by others that they shouldn't make, or success stories. Uh, and ancillary con considerations, whatever that may be. I don't know, every industry has them. Now is, we've established trust by being of service. We've been, a, we've demonstrated, you haven't paid us yet, but we're of service. Guess what, you're in, this is automated, right? You're not doing any work. You did this once and it's happening to everybody. Then the consideration, the possible solutions. Because now people are starting to think like, okay, I gotta do something about this. What are the possible solutions? You open, you lay that out for them. The FAQs start coming. You're there with the FAQs. This could be five emails. Maybe over here you want to accelerate the list. Maybe every day there's enough of FAQ that comes in the mailbox all of a sudden, right? Um, now this is where you say, like, you want to get on a call to talk about this? Maybe we can give you some consulting that you can have a feeling about what we can do for you. Um, sorry, I can't read on that screen either. Make a pro forma offer. This is where you start saying, like, you know, you have the call, and this is where you make a pro forma offer. Why a pro forma offer? Because now he's joining the prospect's team because he got he's got to take that to his boss now or to his stakeholders, right? And so now you come into the decision phase. You're already on the same team now because you've done all this and all that, and this is where you help the prospect convince others. This is the videos and the convince your boss materials that start coming on into their inbox. You know, I, things that, to make the argument. Because often, I don't know if your client is corporate or whatever, or somebody, he's been spending so much time on this problem that he now really wants to get this solved. He just really wants to get this done. We have to help him do that. And this is where you offer another call or a meeting. And this is really where you're gonna go in for the close. This is where you ask for the business. 
the goal is help the prospect convince those others of how they to close this and get this done and move on. So that's what that looks like. Every little white box may be different for your process, but generally that's the feel. You know, that's that's the flow. That's the thing you have to emulate. You may not be on time with everything, but some for some you can sort of dictate the time it will take for people to go. Especially here, this is important. You can sort of help them along on your pace. A little bit manipulative, isn't it? So the process of putting this together is you understand and map the prospect buyers during the FAQs, then you create the content that resonates. This is the workflow. This is what you have to sit down and do actually. This is the work you have to do. You content the content that resonates with each step of the journey. You think about those FAQs, um, and you, you build your email group sequence. You do this once and you tweak it every now and then, but most of the time it's not, too much, it's not that much work once you've done it. And then you monitor the prospect's interaction, and then when you see, oh, these guys are more involved with my content, I'm gonna start focusing on them a little bit more. I'm gonna put them on a short list. I'm gonna put a, you know, I'm gonna start figuring more out about these people, check their LinkedIn profiles, things like that. And then you have a smart universe of real prospects because you cannot, business does never close itself. You have to step in. You have to have that call. You have to have that meeting. You have to have that interaction because people do business with people in the end. But like I told you, I, I find it kind of more interesting and feasible to turn that thing around and do that at the end instead of in the beginning. But I find horrible that you make a contact with somebody and then they say like, okay, now you gotta talk to this person. And then you have this technocrat who's trying to get you out of your business. I like it the other way around. But it actually, again, this is just to show you, um, this is what you and Sophia and, and Kuna, you get something every seven days from me. And so now you know how that works. The, the real example, so this is what it looks like. This is uh, my capital attraction. I, I help people raise capital. It's for entrepreneurs who need investments. And again, I go through all these phases with a free course that I produce. It's kind of uh, blitzy, but uh, I go through the challenge, discovery, consider decision. In the end, the decision that I make people make is, shouldn't you just take my online course? It's a really straightforward product. Uh, this is a friend of mine who's in the diamond industry, and he wants to become Mr. Diamond. For He wants to be the trusted advisor where people want to invest in diamonds and go to him. And I, I'm producing a, a whole video series which takes people through that opaque world of diamonds. I know you know it very well, but this is really about where we, first of all, the goal is to become a trusted advisor. He, he tells you about who's who in diamonds, the diamond hubs, how the industry works, or how it's put together, different kinds of diamonds. This whole series is 12 episodes, or four or five minute videos. Uh, we take you on a diamond journey. Once you're finished with that, you probably want to call that guy if you want to buy diamonds, because you sort of gained your trust. Um, there's another thing I, I am, um, I also have an investment company that invests in Africa and the Middle East. And if I want people to put their money in Africa and the Middle East, I better let them become familiar with it. And that's a typical example. So what I do here is, uh, this is this is just a more like, where I tell people that the world economy is changing, typically a good place to start. I tell them about Africa, fixed income. You get high interest rates in Africa, it's really interesting. I, I tell them about it in 90 seconds in a video. Uh, Dubai, I actually went out in Dubai with my iPhone and I recorded people in Dubai to tell me about Dubai, like what their life was like and this and that. And this is like a, a 40 minute uh, reportage, I would say, about Dubai. It's, people love it because like, you know what, I, I've never thought of Dubai in that way. You've given us the real Dubai. We'd like to invest there. We'd like to, you know, maybe look at the stock market. Nigeria is one of those places. Totally misunderstood in many ways, but we have to sort of, open. so this is a typical example with this company, uh, we created, this is an ongoing sequence. There's, there's 100 pieces of content in that funnel. And then I have the frequently closed objections to go very fast. You know, technology can't replace personal relationships. But somehow, um, one third of the people who get married in the, in the Western world wind up meeting them, each other online. So I don't know if you can choose your life partner, if one, one in three people can do that online. There's something about that online thing, right? <laughs> it's gotta be true. I'm not good with technology, that's BS, because technology is made for dummies, I'm serious. Uh, technology has become so simplified that you just have to click on icons, it's as simple as that. Who uses a Squarespace for the website here? 
You do that sometimes ridiculously simple. Well, I make the language simple. Okay, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you, know, and you could do it. I mean, it's technology is simple. Email lists and all this kind of thing. My favorite one is like, oh, about my company, this blue kind of stuff. It's not about your company. It's about you. You as a person with your own mailing list on Mailchimp, taking, keeping your prospects in check, writing them emails. It's not about your company. It's about you. It's your secret ninja to, to win. So this is the one I get a lot of. It's like, no, I really can't do this because my, my chief technology officer will fire me. I don't know. Um, you, you can still use MailChimp, I guess, because it's online. You don't have to put it to your company. You don't have to company to, or just for a very few. Yeah. This one is, uh, well, what about, what if, okay, I'm going to put all my content online and the competition is going to steal everything from me? Really? Uh, this is about execution, my friends. Uh, it's not about ideas, it's about execution. You have, I have 50 ideas every week and I don't execute e any of them. So they're, some, they're, they're worthless. But this is about execution. The competition cannot be you. The competition does not have your first and last name. They don't have your haircut, sometimes they do. They, they, they're not you, I mean, they can't be you. By producing content which is genuinely you, you have no competition, you see? That's the big thing. Nobody can compete with you because they would become a copycat. This one is tough, right? Um, regulations, respect them. If, if the regulation says, I'm, I'm from the investment industry, I can't sell you an investment online. I know that, and I won't. In fact, I, I don't think it's a good idea. But I can give you information to make investment decisions on your own. So, if you have regulations, Follow the rules. It's funny how when you follow the rules, there's still a lot of pockets that you can make value in. And um, is this for you? I don't know. Is it for you? you have to think about it. And I, like I said, I, I am going to sell something a little bit, right? But anyway, if you if you think this is interesting, if it makes sense to you, I have a I have a bdinsider.com slash ffu. Get on my mailing list. Um, I'll give you some free courses on there. I'll give you some free information. You're going to get uh, my BD Insider letter as well, some insights. Uh, but, you know, I'm putting this thing online. I'm putting a step-by-step -step training program online if you're interested. Uh, so um, it's, it's, uh, it's in launch. It's, it's not going to be expensive. But if you think this is something you want to learn, uh, my business model is to teach you online, so I'll, I'll do a step-by-step -step program. I'm still putting that together. Today was the first time I presented this to an audience. And so this is, a, this is a made in product. I hope it made sense to you. And I really thank you for, for, for your attention and, and, and your, your great comments.